five inches of snow yesterday, which caused the Cubs' home opener to be snowed out. Looks like the Cubs players had no problem with it, though. God. Deontay. Take a look at him making the most of the snow day, snapping pictures for the gram on the field. It, is this correct, though, but the White Sox game was played? That's why it's two to five. I think it was five there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I understand one's the Southsiders. Like, yeah. that is, I mean, two teams, same city. One snowed out. The other, let's, let's just, let's go ahead and play two if we need to. Cubs snowed out this week. Yankee snowed out last week in their home opener. What happened to the global warming thing? We like? skipped spring. We're going to go right to summer as soon as winter decides to end. I don't like I it. I need some sunshine. You and I are going to talk about your global warming skepticism off the air at some point. We'll have a powwow. Okay. Okay. I have a theory on that. Weather and climate. Oh, you got all the... Okay. Yeah. There's no theory, Jenna. Uh, time for some stories to start your morning, which was said in my ear quite loudly, and now I just said it out loud. Last night, the Pelicans clinched a playoff berth with a 113-100 to 100 win over the Clippers. We saw that play a little while ago. Anthony Davis poured in 28 points. How about this Pelicans team? They went 20-13 and 13 since losing Boogie Cousins. Nick, how impressed are you by this team and AD getting to the playoffs? Man, I wrote them off when Boogie went down. I just I thought the West was too tough this year. Now yeah. I'm slightly overrated, I think, the overall quality of the teams in the Western Conference. But Anthony Davis has played like a guy who in a normal year would be a top of the ballot MVP candidate. And this year he's probably gonna end up finishing third. But his this team's success, he is going to get the lion's share of the credit and he should. But we should not forget Alvin Gentry and we should not forget the man you mentioned. Rajon Rondo and Drew Holiday. I th didn't think their guard play was good enough. Their yes. guard play's been better since Boogie went back down particularly. Yeah, a great point by you. I'm glad that we can we can be the kind of show that points out coaches and give coaches some credit. The coach there has done an amazing job under difficult conditions. Boogie Cousins going down after they were performing at a level that we had never seen a one-two punch as far as big men perform at, but also Drew Holiday, his performance, Rondo. Man, he's playing some of the best basketball we've seen him play the last several years. And when you can groom a superstar to be a superstar the way they have with AD, great job by them. And a good midseason acquisition of Miritich, the guy that Bobby Portis punched from the Bulls. They brought him down. He's yep. played well. Knocked him out. Knocked him from Chicago to New Orleans. <laughs> last night, the Nuggets beat the Blazers, keeping their playoff hopes alive. Also, the T-Wolves picked up a win against the tanking Grizzlies. On Wednesday, these two teams will face off for the last playoff spot in the West. Nick, who do you like? Ooh, man, oh man, I hope it's the Timberwolves. The Timberwolves, to me, are a much more interesting playoff team. The Nuggets will go and score a bunch of points, but they can stop absolutely no one. The Timberwolves, now that Jimmy Butler's back, now he's not playing a full minutes load yet, but I imagine the playoffs he would. They have two legitimate superstars and a third guy named Andrew Wiggins who seems to want to be, or at least think he can be a star. I think Minnesota. I think Minnesota's the better team. I think Minnesota is the team with more playoff potential, and they're the team that I think will get that last playoff spot. These are two very contrasting stories. Denver, with no expectations, had a great season. Yep. Minnesota, higher expectations. You can say, man, they didn't necessarily achieve what they thought they would, but also they missed significant time with Jimmy Butler here at the end, so they might have a three or four game lead if Jimmy Butler had been healthy. Minnesota is the better all-round team and definitely a better matchup for Houston in round number one. Tougher matchup for Houston? Absolutely. Okay, and when you yes. said better, that's right. I want to make sure yes. I understood what you were saying. Yep, I agree with you 100%. And finally, let's talk to New York Giants. The team was happy Odell showed up to their off-season workouts yesterday. Odell's quarterback, Eli Manning, says he wasn't that surprised, you know, because it's his job and he's getting paid and that's sort of how a job works. Manning went on to add, quote, I look forward to playing with him this year and for years to come. Chris Carter, do you expect these two to play together for years to come? Yes, I'm one of the few people that thought when the Giants said they wanted Eli as their quarterback that they were being truthful. Um, Eli has brought them two Super Bowls. I know the Giants are very, very fond of that, fond of his leadership, how he's handled the New York media after they made him that first pick in the draft. Yes, I look for, I, I think they'll re-sign Odell. So yes, I look for them for play for a couple more years together. How long that's going to be, I believe that's irrelevant. But Eli has gotten the type of messaging from the Giants that has told him, 
He's going to be there. There's no way on the first day of OTAs that he, as a veteran quarterback, would say that unless the Giants gave him assurances. And also they've assured him, man, we're trying to sign Odell. We're not trying to trade him. That's why Eli. So you marry those two comments together, you can find out what the Giants have told Eli about himself and his career and what they have said about Odell and moving so forward. So do these comments change, not even necessarily change, but affect your opinion on what you believe the Giants are going to do with that number two pick of the draft? No, they don't have anything to do with each other. Well, when you say Eli, that Eli wouldn't say this, if he's not competent, he's going to be there long term. He wouldn't say these that. things. Like, that's that's why I'm asking. I just want to Well, understand. no, I, they still might draft a quarterback. Got it. Okay, so that, that's what I was trying So yeah. when you say you're talking about the long term really being, as you mentioned, you didn't care about the length of it this year. I mean, Eli's 37. Right. What's long term for 37? Two years? Two years is probably a long term. And that's the point. And that's two years is a long time. Even if the quarterback was hot, if the guy was... Like Tom Brady. At 37, Nick, we had him. Hey, man, it's time, to, it's time to look for a replacement. Drew Brees, because of the way he played last year, we'll be saying the same thing about him. Eli is coming into 37 not playing as well right. as these guys. So long term, if Eli don't play well during the season, he could get benched too. That's the, that's the key point that is I learned last year kind of the hard way that maybe – using the historical parameters as far as quarterbacks and their age and what their success could be, that in 2017 and 2018, you can throw those out. Like where we saw, we've seen in the last three seasons, the best quarterback rating ever for a guy 38 years old or older set four different times in the last three seasons. Three times by Tom Brady, once by Drew Brees. It'll probably be broken again by both of them this year. So for players that are still playing at a super high level, the age doesn't seem that relevant. But the age does seem relevant for Eli because his quarterback trajectory has at least followed more of what you would consider a conventional or predictable, normal, normal. Yes. whereas, okay, so his best time was his early 30s. He had a bit of a resurgence a couple years ago with Odell. And then last, and then last year and really the year mm -hmm. before, like you saw it tracking downwards. Now, I don't think he'll be as bad this year as he was last year because the Giants won't be as injured. They'll be better at the offensive line. Odell will be there for more than a couple of games. But, of course, like, there is no real long term for Eli Manning when you're 37 years old and you're coming off a season where your passer rating wasn't in the top 20 in the NFL. Like, the long term for Eli is this season and maybe the next season. Realistically, you pair these two together. What can they do based on what you saw last year? How big of a turnaround pairing these two? could you see for the Giants? They have to do some things offensively. They have to give Eli the protect, the protection that he needs. They have to have some type of running game. Nate Solder is coming over from New England as the left tackle. That should help him in pass protecting. But the Giants' inability to be physical from a running standpoint, that hurts the passing game. Brandon Marshall, he's had a good offseason. He's trying to come back from his worst season as a pro. So they can be one of the most prolific offenses as far as throwing the football. But Throwing the football is not going to get them success in the NFL. They have to have some balance. And the Giants, the only time that they've won is when their defense has been outstanding. Right. So it's not only on Eli's shoulder, Odell's shoulder. It's that organization, that defense, and collectively what they're trying to do. And the defense is where they've spent the lion's share of their money. Like, Eli's got a reasonable contract. Odell hasn't gotten paid yet. They don't, prior to signing the Nate Solder, like, their offensive line wasn't super high paid. Like, their money was spent on those star defensive acquisitions in free agency the season before last and in drafting a guy like Landon Collins. Like, the talent and dollars would say the defense should be one of the ten best in the league, which is was their method in 2016. The offense wasn't elite in 2016. It was good enough to go along with a really good defense. All right, if it feels like it's been a while since we talked about Andrew Luck playing football, it's because it's been a while since we talked about Andrew Luck playing football. He hasn't played a game since 2016 out with that shoulder injury, and it turns out he may be further away from returning to the field than we thought. Luck spoke about his rehab process. Take a listen to this. I'm not a perfect feeling athlete right now, you know, by any means. So there's still a focus on me to make sure that I can feel really, really good, and then be unbreakable. You know, I don't, I don't want to put myself in a situation where, uh, where this happens again, and I have to go through the same thing again and again. No, I've not, I've not picked up uh, the Duke <laughs> and started throwing it yet, and I uh, don't want to skip steps. Uh, I'm trusting the process that I'm in right now very, very much. Uh, I'm trusting myself in this process, 
uh, and when the time is right, I'll pick it up. So, CC Andrew Luck had said earlier that in prior rehab stints, he has skipped a couple steps. He was anxious to get back on the field. He wants to play. Obviously, you know he wants to play. This time, he's very set in his ways that he is going to make every effort to really go step by step to, to make this process work for him. How big of a deal is it, though, that he hasn't even picked up an official NFL football yet? It's not a big deal. I mean, he tore his labrum. And this is an injury that goes back to not him missing the season last year, not him getting injured in 2016. This is the injury from 2015. And in the interview and other publications, they have it's been clear that something went wrong with the procedure and or the rehab. Now, Andrew Luck took some of the responsibility. He said that he's an impatient person, and then, bless you, and then he also said that he doesn't want to take any missteps, which he's he letting us know he made mistakes before. Yeah. He thought his body felt. Now, Andrew Luck is a big, strong guy. Now, we might hear his voice, people who don't know him and see him up per close. Like, he is built like you want an NFL quarterback to be built. So. He thought it was about a physicality thing, and it's not. It's a lot of small. When you tear your labrum, there's a lot of small muscles that you have to strengthen to try to regain this throwing motion. And that's just normal part of the physical therapy process. Eventually, he'll pick up the football. But I'm glad that he understands what the process is now, how the process um, went wrong the last time and trying to correct it. So I think at this point in April, it's not a big deal. He's coming back from a significant, significant injury. He's coming back from basically, you remove like spinal cord, back, neck type of things. Like as significant of an injury as a quarterback can suffer. Like the, obviously, labrum in, in your throwing arm, it's a huge deal. But I want to, I want the audience to better understand what the process is because I will admit, I'm not ashamed to admit, I was super confused because I had read a few weeks ago, Andrew Luck is throwing a ball that's heavier than a football. And then I read today, he's not yet throwing a regular football. And I walked into Chris's office this morning, I said, explain this to me. What, what, what is the process where he would be throwing something heavier, heavier than a football right. but not yet able to throw a regular football so explain the process out because I don't think it makes sense to people who haven't been through it well I think I think Jenna you'll understand this there's a thing called functional strength and what they're trying to do the normal things that he would do in throwing the football all those little muscles he's trying to strengthen them right by throwing a weighted ball the same shape the same size, so when he grips it with his hand, it's, it, it feels the same way. So you're recruiting the same muscles that you would to throw the football. It's not important to throw the football right now. It's important that his shoulder is strong and his shoulder can support the throwing motion, the repetitive motion, over and over and over again. It's just like any other rehab that you're going to go through. You typically have some type of resistance, some type of assistance, and some type of weighted situation to help you, assist you in that rehab. And the analogy you used that I thought was really helpful for me to visualize it is, if a basketball player hurts his shoulder, he might take a, ba a ball heavier than a basketball and work essentially on shots right at the rim. Yes, just to get right up under down. the rim. And you might be able to do that with a heavier ball well before they would have you work on your three-pointers. Yes. So, so when you're saying he's throwing the weighted ball, he's he's really throwing it, but just... Very short. Not just the velocity, just not, to make sure he's got the, the movement. Right. Yes. That, and the so, movement and the motion. Right. And, go ahead. Sorry. How confident are we with, with the process? Because you seem more confident than, I guess, Nick and I were when we were reading about this, that he will be ready for week one, that he will get back to the form, that we will be able to put up numbers that he once did. Um, there's nothing I can tell you that gives me the confidence besides just knowing Andrew Luck, knowing that people have come back from a torn labrum, realizing that also they said something went wrong. So obviously if something went wrong, there's something that could have been corrected. So it's just more of a belief that I have in Andrew Luck, and I believe that his destiny ends up with him being one of the greatest quarterbacks ever compared to him being one of the biggest disappointments that we've seen ever. And, and I want to just, as a football fan, man, I hope he gets back to health because he was unfairly maligned by dopes such as myself for two years who didn't know how significant this injury was, who I held his draft projection against him, saying, this guy was supposed to be the best quarterback prospect in 30 years. He's had one really good season, and that's it. Like, he's not the guy we were told he was going to be. He was playing through a significant injury. I didn't know it at the time. I wasn't the only one, but I will own that. Like, I would like to see what a fully healthy Andrew Luck, as a veteran in this league, yeah. hopefully with a legitimate supporting cast, can actually look like. Because the guys who study guys coming out of college say he was 
going to be one of the great players in this league. Yeah, let's not forget his first three years, they won 11 games. 11, 11, and 11. All right, he was off to a great start. No, look right in the camera, Nick. Say, I'm a dope. Well, I just said it. No, no. The yes, little, let, it, let it marinate. Here, you guys. But, you, but you were criticizing him for years. So let's get like two or three minutes of that. Look oh. right in there. I'm a Could dope. Could the Thunder Andrew be Luck, poised for a go. deep playoff a run? Dope. Next yes. on First Things First. Get in here, Mannix. And I will not apologize to Mannix. Oh, speaking of dopes, where's my friend? Oh. <laughs>